92.1 FM WYSL in Rochester, New York. Also on World News Radio. Today, that's World News Radio. Today, and today we are joined here by Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers is an American businessman, investor, financial commentator, and author. Uh, he is currently based in Singapore. Uh, Rogers is the chairman of Rogers Holding and B Land Interest Inc. He was the co founder of the Quantum Fund and creator of the Rogers International Commodities Index. I have personally seen him introduced on CNBC as the greatest commodities trader of all time. So you have uh, definitely market royalty you're listening to on the show right now. And welcome to the show, Jim. I'm delighted to be here, Jake. Sounds like fun. All right, Jim. Um, I'd like to get to um, what's going on with Trump, with uh, China. Uh, we, we, we hear talk of a trade war. Uh, Jack Ma said that, you know, China didn't steal all your jobs. You spent too much money on war. Um, you know, are, what are we seeing going on with, uh, with Trump and China right now? Well, the first thing, if, if, if there is a trade war, I assure you, you, we should all be very, very worried. Trade wars throughout history have never worked. Nobody's ever won a trade war. Uh, who, whoever the countries are, and if we have a trade war with anybody, it's not going to be good, especially with China, since China's the second largest economy in the world. So if you have, Jake, if you have the two largest economies in the world at a trade war, boy, that's not going to be fun at all. You should be very worried if it happens. I'm very worried that it's going to happen. I hope it's not. When I look at the situation, though, I, I don't see Trump's trying to start a trade war he, I, I, I just see him doing very basic and fair things. I mean, China is much more protectionist than, than the United States is. I, I, I just don't see the beef here, Jim. Well, that, that, it's not the point of uh, who's, who's right or wrong in a trade war, just like it's not right or wrong <laughs> in any war. It, it's the war that's the, that's the problem. Uh, if one can come to a solution without without a trade war, then then great. I mean, happy days are here again with some of the things Mr. Trump says. But the Chinese have been very clear that if you start a trade war with us, we're not going to sit here and say, oh, this is wonderful. Hit us again. We're going to hit back. And that always happens in trade wars. Now, let's, again, let's hope that there can be discussions <laughs> and, and people can come to some kind of reasonable and logical decision. So, so regarding the markets, I mean, it, it's, I, I don't know if we can predict what, uh, what Trump is going to do. Is he going to replace Yellen? Does that even really matter that much? Um, you know, um, what, do, what do you foresee for the United States economy in 2017? Do you, see, do you see growth? Do you see a stronger dollar? Well, yep, Mr. Trump touched taxes cuts regulations, rebuilds infrastructure. Uh, those are good things. They've always been good for any economy anywhere in the world. And, it, and we're going to have wonderful times, especially the, the problem, of course, is how do you pay for all that since America's the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. But the way that could be paid for is uh, there are $3 trillion, $3 trillion offshore, by American companies for tax reasons. Trump says he knows can figure out a way to get that money to come back. So in theory, you can get the three trillion dollars to come home. It will help pay for the infrastructure and the tax cuts, and we are really going to have a good time. On the other hand, Mr. Trump has also vowed to have trade wars with Mexico, China, Korea, Japan. To repeat, you know, throughout history. Trade wars have led to disaster, bankruptcies, and often, well, sometimes to real war. So I don't know. You tell me what he's going to do. I'm not sure he knows what he's going to do. He said some contradictory things a few times, as you probably well know. And so once he resolves what he's going to do, we're either going to have great times or disasters. Jim, if you were in charge 
of the U.S. economy, I mean, what what moves would you make to uh, to start growth and start the good times, as you say? Well, I would cut. I would do some of the things he said. I would cut taxes. Uh, I would rebuild the infrastructure. I would get rid of the regulations. The regulations are crippling for every everybody who does anything not just in business, if you have a hospital or a school or just about anything, the regulations are, are crippling in America compared to other countries. And I would come up with tax incentives to get people to bring the money back to the U.S. I would not start trade wars. In fact, I would open up the borders more and more, both immigration and trading-wise. You know, America became the greatest country in the 20th century because we attracted people to come to America. We gave people land if they would come to America and work, and work, of course. We didn't just say, come and have a free lunch. And we became the most exciting and the most successful country in the 20th century with open borders. Every country in history that's opened its borders has had great success. Countries which closed off have had decline, have gone into decline. So I would, I would open for more trade and more borders. How would you be able to repatriate all of that money that's stashed overseas? I mean, what what would you be able to do to convince those those individuals or companies to 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 bring that money over here? Well, the reason that it's there is because if they bring it home, they have to pay high taxes. Uh, it's legally taxed at lower rates if it's abroad. If nobody's doing anything wrong or illegal or immoral. Uh, but if you cut the taxes to bring it home then most co- companies would bring it home, and especially if you cut the taxes to a, to a level that's lower than they would have to pay otherwise. Just cut the taxes, and, and if, if it takes it, you can give them extra tax incentives to bring it home, but probably just cutting the taxes to the regular level would get the money to come home. So it, it's just a basic tax cut. I mean, this is... This is this doesn't seem too complicated. I, I I just don't I don't understand why this this hasn't happened before. It's it's it, it seems Jake, that see the the problem with you is you're not a congressman. You're not a bureaucrat. You're you're a logical thinker. You're a sound <laughs> mind. But bureaucrats and congressmen don't think like you and normal people do. I don't see the problem either. Of course, money would be better off here. Trump sees that too. But apparently, well, you go to Washington and tell them, okay? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell them tomorrow. So and I hope they'll listen to me. You know, um, I, I, no, not, they're not going to listen to me because they don't. They, they seem to live in a bubble. Like during the, I, no bigger example was during the election when Hillary Clinton, um, during one of the debates, was bragging that Henry Kissinger was a friend of hers and and not too long after that a couple weeks later she had um, you know uh, well Lloyd Blankfein came forward and publicly and said he endorsed Hillary Clinton and for everyone that doesn't know out there Lloyd Blankfein is the the CEO of Goldman Sachs and I mean that obviously was coordinated through her campaign Uh, nothing like that nothing that major wouldn't be Um, that's not something you want to be you know, uh, bragging about. You don't want to be like, I'm close with Kissinger, I'm close with Blankfein. You know, these people don't live in the real... I mean, she just doesn't... She didn't understand, and she probably still doesn't, that the path she was, she is on and was on is, is not the one that's successful for her politically or for the American people. You know, it, it, they, they live in a, in a crazy bubble. Jim, I mean, what do you think? Well, Jake, that's why she didn't win. That's one of the reasons she didn't win. But something does happen to people when they go to Washington. I mean, you could be a perfectly normal human being, American citizen, and then something. I don't know what happens. People go to Washington either as as they get elected or they go there as as a bureaucrat, and something happens. I mean, Washington is not like Omaha. Washington is not like Rochester. It's not like the rest of the world. And I don't know what it is. You know, I, I've traveled around the world a couple of times, and everywhere I go, people love Americans. They love the, the country, but they don't like Washington, D.C. And I always say to them, 
listen, I don't like Washington, D.C. either. So, <laughs> but I don't know what happens when they go down there. Yeah, I mean, and because of that, that weird D.C. bubble they live in, you know, I, I, I just fear that... Uh, a lot of the a lot of the damage done, a lot of the capital that has fled the United States is never going to come back. And I'm not talking about just from automation and all of that. It's just um, we, we just don't have a suitable environment for businesses to want to come here. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's it's too bad because because it wasn't always that way, obviously, you know. Well, the tax structure is certainly not competitive with many countries. Likewise, you know, litigation. I mean, many companies in, in America have to spend huge money for lawyers, for lawsuits. Even if they don't have the lawsuit, they have to protect themselves against the possibility. I mean, America has more lawyers than most of the public, the rest of the world put together. Because every, we're all suing each other. And that's a gigantic expense and, and diversion for many people. Our education system is not what it used to be. You know, Americans don't even finish in the top 20 in the international uh, inter uh, education test. Americans not even in the top 20 as far as health care is concerned, but partly because they, the hospitals and doctors have to spend so much money on litigation, on fighting lawyers, on protecting themselves. No, I, you, you make a very valid point. Now, Trump knows a lot of this. Uh, he says he's going to solve it. Let's see if he does, and if he can. Well, you you li you moved to Singapore. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming for multiple reasons. One of them being business. Um, what is a place like Singapore, which has seen enormous growth, done so well, where the United States is failing? Well, uh, Singapore has been the most successful country in the world in the last forty years, and they set out with two or three things. One, they have a very low tax base. Two, they were only half a million people here 40 or 50 years ago. Now they're five and a half million. But they said, we want to attract uh, immigrants. We want people to come here, but we want smart, accomplished, educated, successful people. I mean, if you're just coming here for in there is no uh, welfare in Singapore. There's no welfare at all. So you can't come here and get on welfare. But if you, they'll let you in, they'll attract you, they'll do everything they can to get you if you're smart, educated, or successful, or accomplished in some way. So first of all, they open the borders to the right kind of people. They have extremely low taxes because they want people to be able to, to work and keep their money. They have very high savings. In order to build an economy, you have to have high savings so there's money to invest. So Singapore probably, well, not probably, it does have the highest savings rate in the world uh, now. There's a lot of money for investment. And they, they did it. It all worked. Oh, and education. They were very, very strong emphasis on education. Uh, Singapore always comes out on top in the edu international education test. As I said a minute ago, America's not even in the top 20 in the international education test. Uh, and they did all the things that you and I, or that a rational person would do if you wanted to build a country and build an economy. I mean, the old man was, he, he's dead now, but he was, he was, he had the insight, and he did it. I, I love this quote that you, that you just, that you said, um, if you were smart in 1807, you moved to London. If you were smart in 1907, you moved to New York City. And if you were smart in 2007, you moved to Asia. I mean, do you, do you, would you still say that that's, that's accurate today? Oh, absolutely. I moved to, to Asia in 2007. You said I did it for multiple reasons. Actually, the real reason I did it, uh, I had a little girl, and I have been writing for many years that China is going to be the most important country in the 21st century. And I said, everybody should teach their children and grandchildren Chinese. Then I had one. Oh, gosh, what do I do now? So we started teaching her Chinese in New York. But it was clear that she was great at it, but it was, it was serious. I had to take it to a place where she didn't have any choice but to speak Chinese. So we packed up. We moved to uh, Singapore. 
which is a neutral, uh, not a neutral, it's a very pro-American, but it's an independent country. And here we are. This works. She speaks great Chinese. We have two, two children now. Uh, no, I, I don't know if you're a parent, but if you're not, the parents listening to this know parents do strange things for their children. They move them to a place where there's a good music teacher or a good football coach, good schools or whatever. Well, we did it. We packed up and brought our kids here so that they would speak men who would speak Chinese and they would know Asia. See, I, I, I thought, you know, for a long time that that India would be the future. Um, but you don't, you're not bullish on India. And you said India as we know it will not survive another 30 or 40 years. I mean, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, India, <clears throat> by the way, if you can only visit one country in your life, Jake, uh, I would say go to India because it's got an astonishing combination of man-made natural sites, the people, the food, the, the, everything, the religions, the languages. Just walking down the street in India is a, a sensory feast. But uh, it's a huge bureaucracy. There are dozens or scores of languages and religions and ethnic groups there. The bureaucracy is worst in the world. When the English ran out of there in 1947, they really just sort of said, okay, you are now in India. But the India you, we see on maps now has never existed before in the country. There have always been the countries there in that area, but the one that we see now is something the English just sort of pushed together in 1947 and ran away as fast as they could. So in my view, it's not a very logical country. It's got a horrible bureaucracy. It's got very high debt. I mean, as I love, love, love to go there. And as I said, if you can only visit one country, you should go to India in your lifetime. But as far as being a great success, I, I think there'll be other places that will be better. Do you, do you think some of that has to do with the caste system, not allowing social and economic mobility? No, of course it does. There are many things like that. There are always country things that hold countries back. But the caste system is certainly one in India. If you, you could be the smartest kid in the block, uh, the best looking or anything else, it wouldn't matter if you were born into the wrong caste. You're never going to go anywhere. That's unfortunate. I, if, if, you, if you have a societal structure like that, I, I, I see it very hard for them to be uh, to be able to really reach their potential. And they, they have a lot of potential. It, they have a lot of smart people over there. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's too bad that they have that, you know, baked in the cake, so to speak. Um, but Yeah, well, when they don't have too much education either. Only half of Indians stay in school after 12 years old. I mean, there are plenty of very, very smart Indians. I mean, if you walk around any place in America, you see a lot of smart Indians. Many of them leave because they don't have much education. They don't have much opportunity. You see successful Indians all over the world. Well, the reason they're all over the world is because it's very hard to, to get ahead in India unless you happen to be involved with the right people. Yeah, and that, 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 you know, there, there's a lot of layers in that, too, to, to unpack. But I'd like to get into... Uh, this quote is, is very interesting by you um, that I caught. Um, you were speaking at Beloyal College, um, Oxford, when you said, the power is shifting again from the financial centers to the producers of real goods. The place to be is in commodities, raw materials, and natural resources. I mean, w would you, would you, uh, so, I mean, w would you put agriculture in that category? Jim? Absolutely. I'm very, uh, agriculture is one of the sectors of the world economy on which I'm most optimistic going forward. I told all those kids they should drop out of Oxford and become farmers. I mean, unless they really love what they were doing. That the, I see great future in agriculture. We've had great cycles in world history. Jake, <laughs> you know, sometimes the people who were producing real goods were masters of the universe. Sometimes it was the financial types who rose to the top. We've had the finance. When I, when I was a student, nobody wanted to go into finance. Um, and and I, I was sort of <laughs> laughed at because I wanted to go to Wall Street. 
but n- n- then, of course, that changed in the 80s and 90s for 30 years or so, and everybody wanted to have a hedge fund. That's changing again. Now it's back to being a farmer. Farming has is, is been a disaster for over 30 years. All that's in the process of changing, Jake. If you don't like uh, being on the radio, think about learning how to drive. You, do you know how to drive a tractor, Jake? I actually do. I grew up on a horse farm, actually. Well, you're ahead of, ahead of most people, <laughs> so be sure to be, be nice to the people who are driving tractors. Maybe you could start a show, the agriculture show, in upstate New York. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, how, how lucrative do you think it'll be? I mean, you, you hinted at it with this, with this quote I, I, I see where, where you said, um, there's going to be a huge shift in American society, American culture, in the places where one is going to get rich. The stockbrokers are going to be driving taxis. The smart ones will learn to drive tractors so they can work for the smart farmers. The farmers are going to be driving Lamborghinis. I'm telling you, you should start Forbes Farming. That's, that's, a, that's a really good quote, but, I mean, you, do you think it'll flip that much, Jim? Well, it always has, always has. When I, I went to Wall Street in the 60s, as I said before, it was a backwater. Uh, nobody wanted to be in the financial district in London or in New York. Literally, everybody wanted to do other things in my, at the universities I went to. Uh, and then that changed. It changed dramatically. You know, only the idiot son went to Wall Street in those days. People couldn't figure out why anybody would want to go there, either in London or in New York. And farmers at times in history have been extremely wealthy. You know, there are always historic reasons. Wall Street collapsed in the in the 30s and 40s and 50s and even into the 60s for historic reasons. Then they turned around after a while for historic reasons and agriculture went down the tube. It's changing again. You know, the average age of farmers, Jake, in America is 58. In Japan, it's 66. I could go on and on with statistics like that. There's nobody becoming a farmer. More people in America study public relations than study agriculture. So there are no farmers in the first place, and I've learned certainly in life that if you can go to a place where there's not much competition, you're probably going to have a, be way ahead of everybody else, and you're probably going to be successful. So nobody's become a farmer. And they're all dying out. Yeah, I'm. You make a very. I mean, you, you're you're the greatest commodities trader of all time. So I mean, you've been introduced. No, no, as no that. don't say things like that, Jake. Jake, Jake, Jake. I'm just <laughs> a guy from the back, small town in the backwoods, trying to survive. Well, I'm, I'm just. I'm just. Uh, Trying, I, I'm just trying to follow your advice here because I mean you've you've been very successful on the market. So I mean if you're, it, it makes me really want to, in, it, it, at the very least, invest in some sort of agricultural, um, I don't know, co-op or or something. I, I, it just uh, if it's going to be that much of a flip, you know that, that that's uh, it's very intriguing. I mean because when we're looking at like the big picture. Of the entire world, I mean, you see, the the EU's in trouble, uh, the U.S. is in trouble. I mean, in, in terms of debt, a large amount of debt, and and their creditors are 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 mostly in Asia. You know, Asia is is, is a huge creditor region of the world, and a, and a lot of the assets are in Asia. I mean, if you include Russia too, they're buying tons of gold right now. So I'm looking at this this picture, and I'm like, you know, I, I have to do something to save myself and, and my wife. You know what I'm saying? You know, this is a this is a very dire situation, Jim. Well, everybody has to make their own decision, but you certainly did your analysis and the, of the facts, and you just, oh, everything you said just now is a fact, it's not an emotion, and those facts happen to be true, whether we like it or not. I, I'm an American, too. I don't like saying that America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. And in Washington, D.C., they have absolutely no clue about what's happening in America or in the rest of the world. But everybody, that's a very difficult decision. Your forebears packed up and left in somewhere and came to America. Your wife did, mine did, my forebears left. But it, I now realize it wasn't easy. But the people who often leave are the ones who have ambition, 
they're brave, they're adventuresome, they're looking for something new, and again, everybody has to make their own decision, but the, your analysis and your facts are absolutely correct. So, I mean, in the future, how will we see that play out? I mean, how are we going to see this this uh, this region that holds all the cards and this this other region, I mean, that has, I mean, not a lot of cards left but nuclear weapons? What do, what do you think is going to happen? Well, there, <laughs> well, unfortunately, what you just said happens to be true, and throughout history, whenever you've had a dominant country that stagnates or, you know, goes into a decline, you had other countries that were rising, often led to conflicts, doesn't have to, it, it usually does, it usually has throughout history, and that is not good for anybody. You know, when you have a war, nobody wins the war, even the people who think they won the war didn't win the war. Look at the British and the Germans. The British thought they won the Second World War. Well, you know, if you were <coughs> two years old in 1945, you would have been better off in Germany than in the UK, and the UK who thought they won the war. So you have a good, good insight, and we have to figure out how it's going to wind up. It's always wound up, nearly always wound up in some kind of conflict. Yes, we have the nuclear weapons, but if you look at a map, Jake, and have to bomb a whole lot of places because it's a big, big world out there. In order to, and even if you win the war, what have you got? Not much at that point. You have more debt. Yeah. I mean, what 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 do you see as the future of the, of the U.S. dollar, Jim? Well, at the moment, I happen to own a lot of U.S. dollars, and the reason I own so many U.S. dollars is because of the turmoil that I have hinted at is probably coming in the world economy. And when there's turmoil, people look for a safe haven. Now, most people think of the U.S. dollar for historic reasons as a safe haven, and it has been. So I own a lot of them because I know that people will flee into the U.S. dollar as things get more and more complicated and tumultuous. Right? The dollar will get overpriced. The dollar will go too high. I hope I'm smart enough to sell it at that point. I don't know what I will, I will do then. But, Jake, I remind you, America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. There's never been a country that's had so much debt as we do. And, again, I don't like saying this. In America, i got these little girls who are Americans, too. But I have to face back. So my point is that the dollar is probably going to be strong, stronger for a while. But then it's going to hit a wall, and it's probably going to collapse. Uh, it's happened to every other country in the world that's been on top. Uh, the currencies have been great for a while, but every currency that you can look at throughout history, when the country goes into decline, the currency goes into decline and sometimes disappears. But also, I mean, we're, we're, we're in unprecedented times in terms of, you know, the world markets. The, I, you've never seen the world markets so upside down with quantitative easing and plunge protection teams. And all that. I mean, I read an article where uh, the uh, Japanese Federal, uh, the F Japanese Federal Reserve Bank. I mean, whatever they call it, I forgot. Owns like uh, nine percent of of everything that's on the Japanese stock market. And you know, that's that's a very. Ah, I mean, it's 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 not good when the government has that much control over an economy. You know, they. they well, so go oh, ahead. You're right. The Japanese Central Bank has been printing huge amounts of money. The Japanese has gigantic internal debt. <laughs> they have very, very borrowed a lot of money in Japan. The Japanese Central Bank keeps printing money and buying the bonds, and they're now buying shares. Well, no, it's, it, it cannot last. To make it worse, you know, the Japanese population is in decline. It's been declining for a few years now because they refuse to have babies, and they refuse to allow immigration. No, I can give, listen, if I were a 10-year-old Japanese, I would move, because when those kids are 40, there's going to be nothing there. I don't know where we're going to get our sushi, you know, in 30 years, because there's not going to be anything left in Japan. And this is happening in many places. 
Never in world history have interest rates been so low, and that's because all the central banks are printing huge amounts of money. Hey, this is not going to work. It's, it hasn't worked so far, all this money printing. hasn't revived any economies. Japan is still in recession. It's not going to work. Be worried. Well, yeah, I, when, I, when I watch CNBC, and they're talking about how oil prices being so low is bad for the U.S. economy, I know we're in some weird, bizarro world. Because I remember growing up, and gas being, you know, under a dollar a gallon or whatever, and that, that was seen as good for the economy. But in, in this weird, controlled, fake market that we have with everything, it seems, you know, low gas prices are bad. You know, it's, it, it, it makes, but it just makes... Have good in Your insights are correct again. At most, there are more people in the world who consume energy than produce energy. So, yes, the lower energy prices the world has, the better for the best number of people. By the way, Jake, I expect the oil price to go back down again for a while. But we're in the process of making a bottom, whether the bottom is 35. It doesn't matter. It's in this range of, you know, 25 to 55. We're making a, a bottom, and it will go back down again. So you'll get a chance to buy some cheaper gasoline soon. But, but, stock up, because then it's going to turn around and go much, much higher over the next few years. Where do you see oil pr or gas prices going, uh, or oil prices going within the next couple of years? Well, gasoline obviously depends on the state or the country, for that matter. Uh, you know, the Germans pay very, very high prices for the gasoline. The Saudi Arabians pay nothing for gasoline, so it depends on the country. In the U.S., it depends on the state, uh, obviously because of state taxes. But as I, I expect the oil to go back down for a while. Uh, again, I'm not very good at market timing, Chase. In fact, I'm the worst market timer. I'm the worst short-term trader in the world. But let's say it goes to 30 or 35 or 40, whatever it is, uh, then that will be making a bottom. And that's when you should stock up. What, what, do you, what do you see with gold and silver? I mean, do you... Uh, I mean, we've had a lot of people on this show saying gold and silver is going to you know, the, the price is going to go through the roof. I mean, what, what do you think, Jim? Well, I own gold and silver and have for a long time, but I haven't bought any, any serious gold and silver for about six, seven years now. Uh, I haven't sold any. I've, I've had some of my gold. Uh, I expect gold to go back down under 1000 But, again, I'm a bad market timer. So the point is I expect another chance to buy gold at whatever price. When it goes, if it goes down, I hope I'm smart enough to stock up on gold, a lot of gold, okay? Because before this is over, gold and silver are going to skyrocket and go through the roof because we're going to have turmoil, chaos, and serious problems in the world. This is not going to end well. Got, you know, in 2008, the world had a big problem because of too much debt. Jake, since 2008, the debt everywhere has skyrocketed not just in America, all over the world. So you know the problem, how bad it was then. It's going to be much, much worse next time around. And then when we start having real turmoil, that's when gold and silver will go to the roof. It, seem, it seems you think uh, in the near term, next couple of years, year or two, you see the United States doing, I mean, relatively status quo in terms of uh, dollar, oil, all of that. I mean, oil going lower, yes, but I mean, nothing really dramatic. But a couple of years down the road, you really see uh, where the hurt is, could possibly come in. Well, again, I, yeah, I hope this year you're, you're right about this year. But again, it depends on what Trump does. If he does the good things, boy, it's going to be fabulous. But if he brings in some of the other things, which he has said he, he swears he's going to do, if he starts trade wars with half the world, that's not going to be good for anybody. And then the problems are going to happen, you know, before the end of this year. But if he does things like cut taxes, cuts regulations, all the rest of it, my goodness, we've been waiting for somebody like that. If, if, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. If, um, 
if Trump, oh, I'm sorry, if Trump passes his one trillion dollar infrastructure package, uh, and he's talked about paying for this, like you said, with with capital that's been offshored, uh, and also with uh, fifty and a hundred year bonds with that have like historically low interest rates. Um, if that really reinvigorates the economy, like if he really gets things going, he starts building airports and dams and bridges and all sorts of you know things that we need, um, combined with these lower tax cuts and and more manufacturing jobs. I mean, could you see the dollar being saved and in, in, in a dramatic price of gold and silver being staved off for a while? Oh yes, absolutely. Go in the world you just described. Gold and silver is not. They're not going to go much higher. They're going to go lower. They're going to go a lot lower. I told you they go under a thousand. Who knows how low it go in the scenario you just outlined? Yes, happy to hallelujah, Jake. You should be president. Uh, yes, if all of that happens. But unfortunately, as I said, there are these other things lurking in the background. America is a gigantic debtor. Everybody's got huge debts now. And trade wars have trade wars have never succeeded. Trade wars have always led to disaster. I guess one of the main lessons of history is that most people do not learn the lessons of history. Many people who even know history <coughs> say that they're smarter than history, or that it's different this time. Well, maybe it is different this time, Jake, but never in the history of the world has a trade war succeeded for anybody. What are your thoughts on these trade deals that Trump has vowed to renegotiate or get out of? I mean, this morning, uh, he just, uh, by a memorandum, he, we left uh, the TPP. And uh, Trump says he wants to renegotiate NAFTA, or if he can't get what he wants, he wants to leave. I mean, what, what, what's your view on, on these deals? Well, <clears throat> free trade has always been better for, for the world than... than closed borders and closed trade, yes, some people suffer with free trade, but remember, in America, there are 325 million people, and if, the, if our cost of buying things goes down and the quality goes up, we're better off. Sure, some people suffer, but 325 million of us do better and better, and then the other people who are suffering can go into find other areas where they, too, can participate and do well. So I know that, that free trade is good. If Mr. Trump can, he says he's going to make these deals better, then hallelujah. That's great. The, the problem is, Jake, it takes a lot of people to, to agree to something, a new trade agreement. In America, it's very difficult to get to any trade agreement through because of the many, many, many vested interests in the people in Washington. But if he can do it, then great. If he can get a better deal for America, that's great. But remember, Jake, the other side has to agree, too. If America is making a deal with Country X, Country X has got to do it, too. They're not just going to sit there and say, oh, Mr. Trump, this is wonderful. You take advantage of us. They're not going to agree unless it's good for everybody. Just my, my analysis of these deals, the NAFTA and, and GATT and CAFTA and, and the rest of them is... You know, it doesn't leave much oxygen in the room for American manufacturers or businesses to produce things within the United States. I mean, it makes it almost virtually impossible. And, and, and it, it seems like it does that on purpose. You know, it, it, it's shutting down things here, moving them somewhere else, and then, you know, when they when those people start to develop a middle class and maybe a... Maybe, I mean, some crazy idea of having trade unions, uh, you know, as, as crazy as that is. I mean, I'm joking, obviously, but, you know, then they move to, say, Africa or something. You know, it, it just seems like the, this group of companies get together and make these deals and just, you know, take wealth and, and implant it in Asia. They take it out of Asia and implant it in, in uh, Africa when, you know, conditions aren't you know, good for them, I guess. And, and, and it's, it just doesn't seem like it's, like we're all operating on a, on a level playing field. Like we're not allowed to compete. You know what I mean? Well, Jake, that part of what, well, yes, but part of it is what we discussed before. In America, we have these staggering regulations 
uh, America spends more on health care than any other country, far and away more money on health care than any other country in the world. We're not even in the top 25 with results. Americans don't live nearly as long as, as other people. That's because of all the taxes, regulations, rules, complications. And we did that to ourselves. Jack Ma, you know, you started this program with saying that Jack Ma said, wait a minute, guys, you did a lot of it to yourselves. We did it ourselves with these, uh, education. We spend far, far, far and away more money on education than anybody else in the world. Our kids are not even in the top 25. Singapore, where I live now, has unbelievably low taxes, very few local uh, regulations. It's a very free, open market. Their kids come out on top in all the international uh, test, test results. So don't, don't blame it on <laughs> A lot of it is, is we've done it to ourselves. You can't blame the education results on the rest of the world. You, except for the fact that the rest of the world does a good job, you can't blame health care being much better in the rest of the world than in the U.S. So, no, I mean, we've done a lot of it to ourselves. We also spend more money per person on health care than any country in the world. What, and, and we get, like, horrible results. Um, infant m- mortality rate just went down under Obama for the first time in a long time. And, and that's con- very concerning. I mean, I know this is a very broad question, um, a very general question as well, but why do you think this is happening? I mean, I, I see in a lot of cases Americans put principle before pragmatic solutions. I mean, do you think that's, that's part of what's happening here? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the principle is in education. Uh, we, when I remember when I was a kid, a long time ago, obviously, but if somebody failed, they failed. They got held back. It's very hard to fail in American schools now. You know, they teach uh, self-esteem. In, in Asia, you, they don't teach you self-esteem. you got to earn self-esteem. If you go to school and don't do well, you don't have self-esteem, but they, they say, well, okay, now shape up. You know, you've got to start doing better in school, or you're going to not. We're going to hold you back. We used to do that in America. So I'm not sure when you say principle. What's the principle? The principle that nobody should fail. Well, that's not very good. That's not a failure. Unfortunately, I've certainly had plenty of failures in my life. And I didn't like it, but I look back, and every time I made a mistake or failed, it was always my fault. But I usually got something out of it. We don't do that anymore in America. We teach you self-esteem. Nobody should have to suffer. Well, I guess the principle I was referring to uh, in healthcare was that, um, you know, we have this system where, you know, the un- well, we used to have this system where the uninsured had, I mean, now everyone is mandated to have coverage, but for the longest time, we had a uh, situation where people who didn't have health insurance just went straight to the emergency room for any minor thing that they had wrong with them, you know, and then they left, ended up not paying the bill, and then that would raise prices for everybody. And instead of just solving the problem, it, instead of just maybe offering Medicaid for everybody, which would, you know, give the government power to, to negotiate all sorts of things, and, 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 and maybe prices wouldn't be so high. For everybody else with private insurance, I mean, I, I mean that that's just one thing, one idea I had, I guess. Well, if you can solve the, the medical problems in America, I, there'll be a statue of you in every city in, the, in America. <laughs> I assure you. You know, as we discussed before, we spend many, many, many more times, uh, as much as every other country in the world, on health care. We don't even finish in the top twenty-five. But you solve that problem, okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll get on that, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> um, but Jim Rogers, thank you very much for coming on the show today. I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I'd like to give you the floor uh, to convey any message or, or plug any project you're working on. You got it, Jim. Well, I don't. I don't have any anything to sell. I could buy my latest book, which is called Street Smarts: Adventures on the Road and in the Markets. But no, I don't really have anything to sell. My my main message, Jake, is 
that people should be worried. They should they should start getting educated. And once they're educated, they're going to be worried. And then they should start preparing themselves for the bad times that are coming. Now, don't invest in anything that you don't understand, you yourself. So everybody, as they start getting prepared, just stay with what you know. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to the guys on the television. Don't listen to the guys in the newspaper. Stay with what you yourself know a lot about. And you'll probably survive the hard times that are coming. Thank you very much, Jim, and we'd love to have you back on again in the future. My pleasure. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Jim.